A few years ago, my partner and I decided to take a trip to California to see some of the state parks, ghost towns, and off-the-beaten-path things that don't get a lot of tourist traffic. For the first leg of the trip everything went great, we camped in our car, found some really great picturesque landscapes, creepy ghost towns, scenic views, and forgotten highways. I absolutely loved it. After about a week and a half on the road, we decided it was time to start heading back to Oregon but we decided to take the scenic route for some of it, instead of just driving straight home on the 5. Our meandering path home took us to the Death Valley area, where there was a short hike to a beautiful waterfall we had seen online and wanted to do before heading back. In lieu of my experiences, I've chosen not to share the name for everybody's safety. We found the trailhead without issue, and began the mile hike to the waterfall. Death Valley is pretty desolate, and I'm not going to lie, it's a creepy place, that spooked me bad on more than one occasion but something about this trail was different, sinister even. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I couldn't hear anybody around us, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary, there were no cars at the trailhead when we got there so I figured we were alone but I didn't feel that way. The feeling persisted until we reached the end of the mile hike and saw the waterfall, we sat for a moment, took a few pictures, and started hiking back towards the car. I still felt like something was wrong. I felt eyes on me, and had a feeling of dread, for seemingly no reason at all. I tried to shake it off, but I just couldn't. I started walking a little quicker to our car, we got there without incident, and starting throwing our hiking poles and water bottles into the back seat of the car. I noticed there was a black SUV with limo tinted windows parked next to us in the trailhead parking lot, it wasn't running, I didn't see anyone around it and it didn't seem like anybody was in it, but where was the driver? The only place the driver could have been was on the same trail as my partner and I, but I hadn't seen or heard the driver on the trail. It was an out-and-back trail with steep rocky cliffs on either side of the trail, so the chances of me seeing the driver were pretty high, and the chances of him being off the trail were pretty slim as the undergrowth was extremely heavy until you got to the cliff side. I also am certain I would have heard somebody crashing through the undergrowth near the trail. As I was thinking about this and getting more and more anxious, I see a huge man emerge silently from the bushes next to the trail to the waterfall. When I say silently I mean it, he made no noise at all. He was easily 6'4-6'6, strong looking, covered in what my partner believes are criminal tattoos, he had a baseball cap pulled down low over his sunglasses, a long full beard, some kind of a rifle slung across his back, and a large hunting knife on his belt. Had he been out there at the falls with us that whole time? If so, why hadn't I heard or seen him? He was holding what appeared to be a cell phone in his hands, and waving down my partner. My partner is a 5 feet 5 inches and skinny, in a silent panic I grabbed him by the arm to keep him from getting too close to the man. I realize now that this huge man had a gun and distance to him was irrelevant but as I said, I was in panic mode. The man said that he had found this cell phone, the one in his hands, near the waterfall, and didn't want us to leave without it. We both quickly checked our pockets, and realized that we both had our cell phones and we both assumed at the same time that this was some sort of setup for a robbery or something far more sinister. We jumped into the car, fired her up and drove up the dirt road as quick as we could. 
The man just stared at us through the rear window as we drove off. It terrifies me to think that he was out there with us the whole time we were hiking and we didn't hear him, see him, or even know he was there. How many other times has something like this happened to me? I never would have known the man was out there with us had he not chosen to make his presence known. I'm not going to lie it really made me think twice about hiking alone in the woods or in isolated and desolate areas. I also find myself wondering what would have happened had we chosen to engage with him, were there others with him? What would have happened to us? I'm not going to lie, I've had nightmares about this man in several instances since this happened. I'm also a lot more careful about where I go, and who I go with. Anyways, listen to your gut. First called Amargosa, meaning bitter water, in the Paiute language, this tiny town situated in the Mojave Desert is today home to less than a half dozen people. Getting its start as a borax mining community, several historic buildings continue to stand today, including the Amargosa Hotel and Opera House, which still cater to visitors. Long used by area Indians, in the 19th century, this site began to be utilized by prospectors and area settlers. In 1907, when a post office was established, the name was changed to Death Valley Junction. However, there was very little here until 1914 when the Pacific Coast Borax Company built the Death Valley Railroad, a narrow-gauge line that operated from Ryan, California, to Death Valley Junction, carrying borax. The railroad, which ran for about 20 miles from Ryan, connected up with the Tonopah and Tidewater Railroad, providing the opportunity for the Pacific Coast Borax Company to profit from the Tonopah, Goldfield, and Bullfrog booms to the north as well as servicing their own borax mines on the eastern fringes of Death Valley. That first year, the town gained several new businesses housed in tents, including a tent hotel, tent saloon, tent store, and a few dwellings. However, the next year, the town began to grow when new mines were found in the area, and a number of permanent buildings were erected. As it began to take on an air of permanence, a number of milling facilities for borax were built in the area, and the town's location made it a social center for the outlying area. From 1923 to 1925, the Pacific Coast Borax Company constructed a number of buildings in Amargosa, hiring architect Alexander Hamilton McCulloch to design a Spanish colonial revival whistle stop, which centered on a hotel, theater, and office complex building. The U-shaped adobe complex also housed a dormitory, a store, a 23-room hotel, and a dining room. A recreation hall was built at the northeast end of the complex and was used as a community center for dances, church services, movies, funerals, and town meetings. At that time, this building was known as Corkill Hall. The town's population peaked at about 300 people, but its heydays were short-lived. In 1927, the Pacific Coast Borax Company moved its headquarters to a new mine closer to Los Angeles, California, and the following year, the Death Valley Railroad discontinued operations between Ryan and Death Valley Junction. Once running parallel to today's State Route 190, the railroad's equipment was pulled up and transferred to the United States Potash Railroad in Carlsbad, New Mexico. 
However, a locomotive from the railroad can still be seen at the Borax Museum at Furnace Creek in Death Valley National Park. Though its main employer was gone, the town survived as a tourist destination until the Depression, when it dropped off dramatically. However, the creation of the Death Valley National Monument in 1933 kept interest in Death Valley high, and though declining, Death Valley Junction continued. Death Valley Junction had rail service until 1940, when most everyone left, and the post office was closed. Area residents then received their mail from Furnace Creek Ranch, some 30 miles away. A couple of decades later, another post office was opened in 1962, this time reverting back to the name of Almargosa. In 1967, things changed again for the small town when New York ballet dancer, mime, artist, and actress Marta Beckett and her husband suffered a flat tire in Death Valley. From an early age, Marta showed amazing creative talents, including dancing, playing the piano, and artistic qualities. As a young woman, she danced at Radio City Music Hall and on Broadway in New York City, appearing in Showboat, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, and A Wonderful Town. In 1962, she was married and soon began to tour the country. In 1967, after months of touring, she and her husband decided to take a vacation camping in Death Valley. However, one morning, they awoke to find a flat tire on their trailer. Directed to Death Valley Junction by a park ranger to have the tire repaired, Marta began to explore the old adobe buildings while it was being fixed. Fascinated with the old buildings, she discovered the old theater and was enthralled. Peering through a small hole in the door at the back of the building, she immediately knew this place was meant for her. Later she would say, peering through the tiny hole, I had the distinct feeling that I was looking at the other half of myself. The building seemed to be saying, take me, do something with me. I offer you life. And that's exactly what she did. Having always wanted to design her own costumes, choreograph her own dances, and create her own show, she and her husband located the town manager. The very next day, they agreed to rent the abandoned theater for $45 a month and assume responsibility for repairs. Originally called Corkill Hall, she renamed the theater the Amargosa Opera House, and almost a year later, on February 10, 1968, she gave her first performance to an audience of just 12 adults. That same year, the town's name was once again changed to Death Valley Junction. Somewhere along the line, the post office closed its doors forever, but Marta Beckett and the Opera House continue to welcome visitors today. In the early years of the theater, there were few visitors, sometimes none at all, so she soon began to paint an audience on the wall. From 1968 to 1972, characters from the past, including kings and queens, Native Americans, bullfighters, gypsies, and more, took shape. After four years of painstaking work, she then began painting the ceiling with cherubs, billowing clouds, and ladies playing antique musical instruments. It was completed in 1974. Through the years, the audience grew, and the theater gained attention. Donations were made for the continued renovation of the theater, including a concert grand piano and chairs for the theater. 
Parts of the main building became a hotel and cafe as renovations continued to be made on the old buildings of the town. With the help and legal advice from friends and through the Trust for Public Land based in San Francisco, the Amargosa Opera House Incorporated bought the town of Death Valley Junction. On December 10, 1981, it was listed in the National Register of Historic Places. In 1983, the Opera House bought 120 theater seats from the Boulder City Theater in Boulder City, Nevada, to replace the charming but old garden chairs needing retirement. That same year, Marta's husband left for other interests, but before long, in walked Thomas J. Willett, a comedian who stepped in as stage manager and MC. He also co-starred with Marta playing other parts in the production. Unfortunately, Willett died in 2005. Somewhere along the line, the cafe closed but was reopened in 2009. The Opera House and Hotel also remain open, as well as a small museum. In addition to the buildings of the Hotel and Opera House, several old buildings and the old train yards can still be seen. There are no gas stations. Death Valley Junction is located at the intersection of SR 190 and State Route 127, just east of Death Valley National Park. Though Death Valley Junction has not been known as a place of tragedies, it is allegedly haunted, according to a number of reports. One interesting ghost, who has long been seen, is a mysterious cat who has been known to interrupt Marta's performances at the Amargosa Opera House. Also allegedly haunting the theater is the spirit of Tom Willett, Marta's former partner, who has often been spied sitting in one of the chairs observing performances. An unrenovated section of the hotel has long been affectionately referred to by the staff as Spooky Hollow due to a number of strange happenings that have taken place there. This part of the building was once used as a dormitory for the miners during the Borax days, as well as including a hospital and more. In room 24 of the Amargosa Hotel, Guests have repeatedly reported hearing the sounds of a crying child at night when no children are staying at the hotel. This may be the ghost of a young girl who drowned in a bathtub in 1967. Room 32 is said to harbor a threatening, malevolent presence that chills visitors. Evidently, this room was once called home to a mining boss, and it is known that hanging took place in the room during the Borax heydays. Room 9 is said to be the most haunted. Here, a number of people have reported that while they are sleeping, something holds their legs and feet down. Yet more have heard the doorknob turning, only to open it and find no one there. Sounds of a child giggling and running down the hall outside the room have also been heard. In the dining room, guests have reported hearing voices of what sounds like a group of people, especially the distinctive high voice of a woman. Other activities include strange noises coming from the walls, shadows that are often seen dancing across the stage, the sounds of footsteps crossing rooms in the night and coming down hallways, the scent of lilacs, and showers that seemingly turn on by themselves. According to reports, guests are often known to pack their bags and abruptly leave in the middle of the night.